So it is Easter Sunday, as we all know, and today I am going to do a couple of things. I'm going to do two things that I think most pastors would not do on Easter Sunday. So uh, two things. First, I'm going to be preaching from a text that is not your typical uh, Easter sermon text or message, uh, you know, the place in the Bible and the scriptures where you would preach from on Easter Sunday. It's, it's a perfectly fine packet, uh, passage. It's just not one of those passages that you would expect to hear on Easter. We'll talk about that in a second. And then the second thing I'm going to do today is I'm going to tell you some things about myself and my family that might create a little bit of tension between you and I. So, so here's the thing. Let's just kind of let's just kind of be be open and be transparent. Let's be honest here. Um, on uh, Easter, uh, you know, people come to church sometimes that maybe they don't ordinarily go to church on a regular basis, and that's fine. We love that you're here. We welcome you. Um, sometimes there are just people that they just you know Easter they go to church and they show up on Easter, and we're we're glad to have you. Uh, some of you here today, um, you've been invited by a friend or a family member, maybe you're from out of town, and uh, me announcing that I'm going to do two things differently uh, has the person that invited you very nervous right now, and they're just praying, Jesus, don't let Pastor Eric embarrass me, okay? Um, so I will try not to do that. But here's the thing, on Easter, there's a great deal of pressure for pastors and for churches to kind of put on a nice face, right? To not say anything that might set somebody off you know, and like create any kind of tension between, but we're just going to try to navigate this together. So I'll do my best. And if you can do your best too, I think we can come together on this. So what we're going to do is this, let's talk about the text that we're looking at today. Um, We, for the last several weeks here at Cornerstone, uh, we've been in a series of messages that we call Upside Down. Okay. So this series of messages, we've been looking at Matthew chapter five, right at the beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Uh, If you are familiar with any of Jesus' sayings, the chances are pretty good that it came from the Sermon on the Mount. This is like a famous section of teaching. In fact, I think there's a lot of things that Jesus says in there that people who aren't even particularly Christian or religious, they know those sayings, but they don't realize that that's where that came from. So at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus lists out eight descriptions about the kingdom of God. We call them beatitudes, and you heard them read in our scripture reading just a minute ago. Uh, And so what I want to do is I want to just give us a little bit of context of where we are at, because Matthew's writing, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 5, but in Matthew chapter 1 and 2, Matthew has made it a point to tell us about Jesus's birth. And he, he shows us that Jesus is not an ordinary, did not have a birth that was an ordinary circumstance. Jesus, uh, Matthew tells us, is the fulfillment of prophecy, prophecies that took place generations before that. And then he tells us that there were signs in the heavens. There was a star, and then these foreign dignitaries, these magi came, and they worshiped him, and they treated him as though he was king. So even at his birth, something was stirring. And and I imagine that the people in that day were talking about this, right? They were whispering about it. The stories of this child that were born were spreading around. And then in Matthew chapter 3, we read about Jesus' baptism. At his baptism, there's more miraculous things that take place. We're told, Matthew tells us that the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus in the form of a dove. You know, I don't know what that looks like, if it's a a real dove or bird, or if it's just like, you know, some of our artwork has like a glowing kind of a figure of a dove coming down. But the Spirit descends, supernatural event. And then God speaks from heaven and says, this is my son. So you, again, you can imagine if, if you were there today with your phone, you would get your cell phone out and you would record it and you would send it to social media and there would be a viral video of a supernatural event going on. In, in those days, they didn't have phones, so they talked. And, and certain enough, there's a buzz going on about Jesus. And then at the end of chapter 4, right before Jesus begins this sermon, at the end of chapter 4, what we have is Jesus going out healing the sick and, uh, and, and delivering people from demons, when that, when people that are demon-possessed. He's delivering them of these evil spirits. So again, powerful ministry is taking the place. And then we have chapter 5. Now, what has happened here is a great crowd of people has gathered around Jesus, and Jesus goes up to the side of a mountain, and he sits down as a teacher would in those days, and he begins to speak. And I think in that moment, in that audience, I think you could hear a pin drop. 
I think everybody was tuned in because they were under the rule and the reign of the Roman Empire, and they were under the, you know, it was just, it was, they were taxed by them. They didn't have all the religious freedoms that they felt they needed. They wanted to be back up on top, and so they're waiting for their Messiah. They're waiting for their king to come, and they're waiting for this proclamation that he's going to give them, and Jesus opens his mouth, and he says, blessed are the poor in spirit to a bunch of people who know what it's like to live in abject poverty. He says, blessed are those who mourn. And I think at this point, there might even be gasps going on in the audience or people scratching their head. Mourn? Jesus, don't you know we're mourning the fact that the Romans have taken over us? And what, what, how is that a blessed life? Jesus goes on, he says, blessed are the meek. You know, the Romans were, were proud and they were brash and they were arrogant and they asserted their authority. But Jesus says, no, you're not blessed if you do that. You're blessed if you're meek. You're blessed when you have a good, true view of yourself and you live in strength and humility towards others around you. Jesus goes on and he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Again, this is upside down to their thinking. I, I imagine people in the crowd saying, Jesus, I'm already hungry. I don't need to be hungry for anything else. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart. I think this one kind of cut them kind of deep because I think they knew that they had tried to have outward purity through their actions, but I think they knew deep down that they were not pure in their hearts. And then Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. And I think if people were going to be stirring and leaving, they certainly were murmuring in the crowd, I think, at this point, because the last thing that they wanted was to have peace with Rome. They wanted Rome just gone. Just take them off the map. Let's just get, like, there were groups of people that wanted to attack Rome with the sword through violence and get back on top. And we have this, this Messiah, this, this one that has worked with power, and he's coming telling us that we need to be peacemakers. And then Jesus says this in verse 10, the last beatitude. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I mean, again, this is upside down. These people are persecuted. They, they know what it's like to be underneath the rule of Rome. This is, they know what it's like, and it's not a good thing. So, as you can see, this is the text that we're going to be preaching on today. We're talking about persecution. Happy Easter, right? Like, you're all, we're all in, our, um, we're all in our, our Easter clothes, right? You know, this is my $11 special uh, on sale from, uh, uh, from Old Navy. Come on now. You know, you got their Easter dresses on. We're all nice, but we're talking about this. So, you know, as a pastor on Easter, I acknowledge the fact that this isn't my, maybe the most guest-welcoming theme or topic, okay? I get that. But hang with me for a minute, because I was going to tell you a little bit about myself, and my family. So here's the thing. If you've been to our church for a while, you know this about me already. This will not come as a surprise to you. But what I'm going to tell you may kind of isolate me a little bit or ostracize me a little bit from you. And and you're ready for it? It's this. Uh, My family and I, we are, we are Cubs fans, okay? We are Cubs fans. See, I'm hearing the boos already. All right. Some of you are like, "Ah," like you can't, like you, you can't even want to see this on the screen here. So how many Cubs fans do we have in the room here today? Okay. Jesus, give me strength. All right. How many Cardinals fans do we have in the room here today? All right. See, that's what I was afraid of. Okay. We moved down here in 2010 from the Chicagoland area. My wife and I, uh, we both grew up in the Chicagoland area, um, and we grew up, you know, cheering for the Cubs and all that. So when we came down here, things were uh, decidedly different, right? They're significantly different. I I remember we had been here a few years, and I was on my day off. I was working in my garage. My garage was open, and um, the mailman pulled up, and uh, uh, I just kind of looked over, and he waved me, almost immediately waved me over, and I thought, oh, I must be getting a package because I love getting, you know, who doesn't love getting a package, especially in the middle of the summer? It's like Christmas whenever the mailman gives you a package. So I went down and I'm all excited and ready. And he proceeds to say to me, I can't remember the exact one. I think the joke he told me was this. He said, why is it always good to date a Cubs fan? And I was like, wait, what? What are you talking about? And he goes, because they never expect a ring, you know? And I was like, I was like, I was like, so you, do you have a package? And he's like, no, I don't have a package. I'm like, don't, just give me my mail. Don't give me a hard time, okay? So, because he saw like our stuff in our garage or our bumper sticker or something. 
Um, when we were here seven months, uh, it was July of 2010, my son Parker, I think he was six at the time, um, we were here for an event and someone decided to go to our minivan and put one of those license plate covers on, but they bought us a Cardinals license plate <laughs> cover. And this is the resulting picture. Now, this is, this is Parker's, this is my son Parker, isn't he adorable right there? He's got no teeth, front teeth and everything. <laughs> But here's the deal. This is Parker's second reaction because his first reaction, he went out, he immediately saw it and he just broke down in tears and wept. Mom, Dad, they're going to make us Cardinals fans. He was mortified. It was terrible. All right, so one other story. So we kind of, okay, so I got to balance that out with the other side. My wife and I were uh, on a, a way for a Friday night and we had someone staying with our kids and Uh, We got a call from the babysitter. Um, This was, I think it was Kent, and I think Kent was maybe in first grade. And um, we were told that, uh, actually, I said it wrong in first service. I said Redbird. It's Fred Bird. Fred Bird was at his school. I think he was in first grade. And we got, he got a note that was taken home. Um, Kent, apparently, during the day when Fred Bird was there, he decided to kick Fred Bird. (laughs) So... I guess, you know, when you deal with that back and forth. But anyway, listen, so, so let's, kind of, let's kind of put some of these dots together because some of you are like, what kind of church is this? All right, so let's get this put together for a second. Uh, let's look at our beatitude that we're looking at today. Verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So as I've just illustrated, you know, as a Cubs fan in the St. Louis area, you know, my family and I, we get all sorts of grief, you know, about being Cubs fans. So when I go to my, my drawer and I pick out a Cubs shirt and I put it on, I just know that someone's going to tell me some joke that I've never heard before, right? Or they're going to make some comment or they're going to roll their eyes. Now, look, I am not going to say, I am not going to sit here and say that, um, um, that what I experience is the same as persecution, okay? All right, I'm not going to say that that's persecution. It's like, but it's in the same vein, at least, right? I mean, it's, it's maybe down here. I mean, the mailman might be here. I think my son Kent kicking. When you're kicking something, I think that's closer to persecution. So I don't think that what I've experienced is persecution per se, but certainly I have a decision to make when I take that shirt out. Am I going to wear it or not? And you know what? I wear it. Why? Because it doesn't matter to me. No offense, but I'm not going to stop being a Cubs fan because of some comments or, for, or some jokes. Just like you're not going to be stop being a Cardinals fan because someone says something about the Cardinals or, you know, of, of course, I don't know what they would ever say about the Cardinals. But, you know, if, but you know what I'm saying? Like, you're just not going to stop doing that. Why? Because it's worth it for you. It's worth it. You have chosen to be a fan and it's, you have value in that. Uh, author and preacher uh, John Stott In talking about this verse, he said this. He said, persecution is simply the clash between two irreconcilable value systems. So you have two value systems that you can't reconcile, and that's where persecution happens. And so when you have a Cubs fan and you got a Cardinals fan, two different values, you're going to have clashing. You're going to have persecution. Again, same kind of vein, maybe not outright persecution, but certainly down, you know, ribbing, joking, and those kinds of things take place. So as much as we're talking about persecution today, really what we're talking about is about what we value. It's about what is worth it for us here in this life. And I think it's important that we make this distinction. Jesus doesn't just say, blessed are the persecuted, and then he leaves it at that. I mean, Jesus isn't telling us that it's a good thing to be persecuted. He qualifies it. He says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. I mean, you know, there there are all sorts of different ways that you can be persecuted for things, right? You can be persecuted for being obnoxious. You can be persecuted for being self-righteous. You can be persecuted for a good cause or for a bad cause. Jesus is not saying that being persecuted makes it good or being, the, the act of being persecuted is good. He's saying that we are blessed when persecution comes because of righteousness, when we value righteousness. So we need to answer this question, what does it mean to be righteous? What is Jesus saying it's worth it to be persecuted for? So what we have here is we have the beatitude in verse 10. All of the other beatitudes are formatted this way. Blessed are those who, and then there's a description. All of them are that way. But Jesus adds two more verses or two sentences after this, 
that explain both the first half and the second half of this beatitude. I think it's because this beatitude is the hardest for us to understand. So the next verse talks about this highlighted portion here because of righteousness. It says this, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. So in the previous verse, he said, blessed are those uh, who are persecuted because of righteousness. And here Jesus clarifies it. And he says, it's really, you're blessed because of that. What you experience is because of me. Now, when we hear the word righteousness, I think a lot of us think about being moral or being good or living kind of an upright life. But in the scriptures, righteousness is more than that. Jesus is talking about those who suffer because of him. We can put it this way. Righteousness is more than just living right. Righteousness is living in right relationship with Jesus. It's a relational thing. It's when we say that we're going to be like Jesus. We're going to live out the demands of the kingdom. All those beatitudes we listed, we're going to, that's what we're, being righteous is falling in line with what those beatitudes are and the way of the kingdom. Jesus is talking about our values here. There's a way of the world and there's the way of Jesus and they're in conflict with each other. Jesus is saying, yeah, that when you live in this life, if you're going to live for me, you're going to have conflict with the world sometimes. And sometimes that persecution could be great as it is in other parts of our world. And sometimes the persecution may be somewhere lower down on the scale. But the reality is you're blessed when you're experiencing that because of me, because of righteousness. Jesus is talking about what we value, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of this world. So what do you value? Do you value righteousness or do you value unrighteousness? Do you value living for, your, for him or do you value living for yourself? See, the message of the beatitude is that you're blessed when you're persecuted for aligning yourself with Jesus and making him your savior and your Lord. So let's look at the second half of this beatitude. Let's go back to verse 10. It says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So just like he did in verse 11, Jesus now explains the second half in verse 12. Rejoice and be glad. I mean, again, this is not like rejoice over persecution. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So why should we rejoice? Why should we be glad? Why should we feel blessed when we are persecuted for righteousness? It's because of the reward. It's because you're identified as a citizen of God's kingdom. So Jesus isn't just saying, hey, follow me and let's all be persecuted. Now that might happen and that may very well be the reality, but what he's saying is when you follow me, the reward is worth it. That's the key here. We're talking about values today. And what Jesus says is when you follow me, the reward is worth it. You're not going to be disappointed. So in, uh, as a Cubs fan, one of the things that we are often known for saying is there's always next year, right? We said that year after year after year after year. But when that year finally came and we won the World Series, can I just tell you, it was that much sweeter, that experience of winning in that day. I know some of you are like, well, if you're just a Cardinals fan, then you'd win all the time. I get it. Okay. I understand that. But for me, try to have some empathy and put yourself in my shoes for year after year. But when we experienced it, it was that much sweeter. And church, when you follow Jesus, any persecution you faith, face, any kind of thing, wherever it is on that scale, it is worth it in light of eternity. Temporary circumstances in this life pale in comparison with the life to come. Uh, one of my heroes is a man named Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott was a missionary, and he was trying to reach this group of people with the gospel, and he went and he ministered to them. And while he was doing that, he was killed uh, by the people that he was trying to reach. He was a martyr for the faith. And in his journal, uh, he's a prolific writer, but one of the things that he wrote, one of his fa most famous quotes is this. He said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And you know what? I just wonder how many of us in this life try to hold on to temporary things at the expense of eternal things. It's like we get it mixed upside down. We hold on to what we can't keep and we lose what really matters in the process. And so we, I think, need to ask ourselves this question. What do we value? Are, are we willing to give up temporary pleasure, notoriety, possessions, recognition, maybe some friendships? Are we willing to give those things up for something eternal, something greater? Are you seeking, uh, seeking a temporary reward or are you looking for 
an eternal one. So when we talk about persecution, as much as we're talking about that, we are actually talking about what we value. So what do you value today? And I'm going to use the language of our text today in asking you this question. What are you willing to be persecuted for? All right, this is not necessarily a nice thought. I get that. But I'm really trying to drive at the idea of what is it that you value I mean, certainly there's something, right? I mean, all of us, to one extent or another, regardless if you are a follower of Jesus or you're not, whether you, someone would dragged you here, you came here willingly, whether you're an atheist or a believer, whatever in between, all of us, I think, are willing to deal with some measure of persecution for something, right? At the very least, your family, right? Maybe your friends. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for men and women who served our country in conflict and died so that we could have the freedoms that we have. I mean, there's some sort of measure of persecution in that sense or conflict at least that they said was worth it for them. So what is worth it for you? What do you place value in on your life? Is it something temporary or is it something eternal? What about righteousness? Is it worth it for you to live like Jesus and perhaps have conflict in your life? See, there are two choices. There is the way of the world and there is the way of Jesus. You can say, God, thy will be done, or God, my will be done. And, and, and the truth is, if, if you don't want to live for Jesus now, you won't want to live with him in eternity. And when you decide what's worth dying for, that's when you'll discover what's worth living for. And I think that this is something that I want us to try to grab onto today is determine and recognize what is it really in my life that's worth dying for. Because I, I have a feeling that if you're like me and you're like most people, we end up holding and clinging to things that really don't matter in the long run. And we focus so much on the immediate that we lose sight of the eternal. We build our lives and try to make something out of it when it's really our life here is just a vapor in the light of eternity. Now I want to do something here today as, as we conclude and as we move to kind of a, a response to the message today, I want to take this question that's at the top of the screen here, and I want to spin it around on us, and I want to ask it in a different way. And in, in so doing, what we're going to do is we're going to pull this all around and get back to Easter. I want to ask us to think about this question. What was Jesus willing to be persecuted for? What did Jesus value? What was worth it to him? See, now we're getting to the heart of Easter what Jesus was willing to be persecuted for was for you and for me. We've talked today about righteousness and we've talked about the reward. And Jesus died, Jesus was persecuted on the cross for you, for your righteousness and for your reward. You see, our righteousness just simply isn't enough. The scriptures are clear, and I don't even think I need to go to the scriptures to prove that to you. I think if you are all honest with yourselves, as I am with myself, we can all say that we've sinned, we've, we've made decisions that are harmful to ourselves and to others. There are, all of us at one point or another have said, God, I'm going to do my will, not your will. The Bible calls that sin. We don't like to use that word in our modern society, but that's what the scriptures call it. When we say, my will be done, we sin. And we break relationship with God. And our righteousness isn't enough. But that's what Easter is about. Easter is about Jesus coming and living the life that we couldn't live because of our sin. And dying the death that we deserved because of our sin. So that we could experience the righteousness and the reward that we could never earn on our own. Our righteousness isn't enough. And I couldn't earn the reward because I already forfeited it by the way of my life. But Jesus said, you are worth it. You are valuable, and I'm going to take my righteousness and my reward, and I'm going to go to this world. I'm going to experience suffering. I'm going to experience pain so that you can have life. And that's the story of Easter. So as strange as this text is, and we don't like thinking about following Jesus and being persecuted for it, I'm telling you today, it is absolutely worth it. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which we, he cannot lose. And so today, I want to just conclude and ask you to consider this question in response. Jesus died for you, so will you now live for him? Is it, he, he saw fit, he saw the value in you to die for you and then go to the cross on your behalf. So now we have a choice to make. How will we live for him? Because here's the beautiful thing about Easter. Easter isn't just about the cross. Easter is actually about the empty tomb. The fact that Jesus rose from the grave. And when I ask this last question, will you live for him? 
It's with that mindset that we have, where we recognize that because of Jesus' death, because Jesus rose again, it's not that I just kind of eke my way through this life, but I go strongly and boldly and with confidence, because these beatitudes that we listed, they're not just descriptions of the kingdom, they're descriptions of the king. And if we're going to be a part of that kingdom, then we need to have these marks on us as well. So are you willing to live for Jesus in the same way that he lived and died for you and now has come to new life? Are you willing to step into that and experience that today? Let's take a moment and let's pray. God, today we ask that you would speak to us and that you would show us what it is that you want us to do in response to your word. God, I believe there are people in the room here today who are far from you, people who have uh, not been living in relationship with you, They've not been righteous as uh, the scripture that we looked at today was talking about. And if they're honest, they would admit that they have been or perhaps they are living a life that says, God, my will be done. And they're not submitting to you or your ways. And they feel that separation now in this place. And God, I pray that you would bring conviction. You'd bring awareness, God, of their need for you. And God, I pray that as they call out to you, that you would save them. As they confess their sin, As they ask for forgiveness, I pray that you would restore them into relationship with you. But God, I pray for believers in this room as well. Because sometimes uh, when we live out our faith, we live out our our faith out in ease and comfort. And, And sometimes we forget that the demands of following Jesus are high. And so God, I pray that you would bring conviction to believers in this room who maybe have just been uh, coasting through this life. I pray that they would live out uh, the life that you've called them to live a life of righteousness, God, anticipating the reward, not getting comfortable here, but looking to the reward that we will have in eternity with you. So Lord, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts today. We ask this in Jesus' name. If you could keep your eyes closed for a minute. Each week, we give opportunity for people to respond to the message. And I'm gonna ask you to do two things today. If if you're here today and you are not a follower of Jesus and you're far from him, and you know, that, uh, if, if, you know that if you were to die today, that you would spend eternity apart from Jesus, apart from God, because you've been saying, my will be done, my will be done, my will be done. And you maybe don't even mean it in a mean or defiant way, but you know that your sin has separated you from God and your righteousness isn't enough. If you're here today, I'm going to ask you to do two things for me. I'm going to ask you in just a moment to raise your hand. Everybody's eyes are closed. Everybody's heads are bowed in this place. And I'm just going to ask you, this is a moment just between you and me and God. The reason why I'm doing this is just so I know who I'm praying for. Just a practical thing. I just want to know who I'm praying for. In a minute, I'll ask you to raise your hand. But then secondly, what I'd like to ask you to do when we're singing these next couple songs, I want you to either take that card, that connection card that's by you, and fill it out and mark that you're responding to follow Jesus. Or you can go to the website, bethalto.church, and go to the next steps and mark there. Fill out that form for I decided to follow Jesus. Because I just want to connect with you this week. I want to call you. I want to pray for you. I want to give you some uh, resources to help you in your journey of faith. So if you're here today, this is the first step. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Eric, I need to enter into a relationship with God. I'm far from him. You know, you're talking about how he was persecuted and he valued me so much. I need to accept the work that Jesus did on the cross for my behalf. And I need to be forgiven. I need to be in relationship with him. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand up really high so I can see it. Go ahead and take a moment. Yeah, I see that hand. Anybody else want to respond? Let's take a moment here. Give everybody ample opportunity. Raise it high so I can see it. Thank you. Church, let's pray. God, we pray for those who have raised their hands. God, I ask that you would be with each one. I pray, God, now that as they confess their sin to you, as they speak to you, as they call out to you, as they say, Jesus, be my Lord, Jesus, be my Savior, God, I pray that you would transform them and you would make them new and they would enter in to real, transformed relationship with you, God. That the old would be gone and the new would come. They would experience forgiveness. They'd be drawn close to you. And I pray your provision for them and your blessing over their life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, can we take a moment and and celebrate and rejoice at those who've responded to what God's doing? This is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. We're going to take a time to respond. We've got two more songs we're going to sing. And what I'd like to do is, um, if you would stand with me now, um, we're going to sing. I'm going to invite our prayer team to come forward. If you're here and you just want to be prayed for, 
It could be for a big reason or no reason other than you just want someone to pray for you. I'm gonna invite you to come forward and be prayed for by one of our prayer team. These folks, uh, they care about you, they love you. Uh, They're gonna keep whatever you ask uh, to pray about confidential. Uh, If you want them to pass it on, they'll pass it on to our our prayer chain. Um, And then if you would just take a moment I'm going to do this. I'm going to take some time and I'm going to kneel at the, at the stairs here. So it's, it's to be prayed for or if you just want to pray. I find it's really important for me as the pastor, as someone who's preaching, to stop and to think about what I've just said to all of you. I want to live out what I'm speaking to you all. And so I would trust that you do too. And, and for me, moving from where I am and going down here is a way for me to just get, get alone with God, get away, to move towards him and to meet with him in a meaningful way. So maybe you wanna do that and you wanna take some time to respond. Otherwise, we're gonna sing some songs and we're gonna worship God. We're gonna celebrate the resurrection and the hope of the new life that we have in him. So worship team, lead us. If you need prayer, come on forward and let's respond today.